Hi everyone, so welcome to the live stream today. Always a pleasure coming your way as we try to finish up with our discussion towards the August 2022 examination. Hi, so and I believe that today. you I believe that you are working hard as we try to bring home our discussions relating to the various things that we have to focus on to increase our chances of passing the examination. Um, Today, we want to just uh, touch on some few things, share our thoughts on some uh, few key uh, issues in financial reporting, corporate reporting, then also answer any questions that you may be having as we try to uh, bring our knowledge up to speed with the various things that we have to focus on to increase our chances of ultimately passing the exams. And I see some of you guys joining. You are welcome. Uh, we're looking at issues relating to financial reporting and corporate reporting. And uh, we'll be also taking some questions from you in relation to what, uh, any questions you have for me and something that you would want me to share my thought on. So if there are any questions, put it in the chat for me, put it in the comment uh, session for me. I would want to uh, take any questions that you are having and also provide you with some uh, answers as we uh, you know, bring up a discussion to the end relating to the August 2022 examination. So if there are any questions, put it in the chat for me, put it in the comment section for me, and I'm going to be taking all your questions. We are live on Facebook as well as on YouTube. So if you join us, give us a thumbs up on the video and also share the video. Let's reach as many students as possible watching the video. Right, so um, as you see in the title, I want to share some thought on some few key issues relating to the standards. Uh, and also uh, remember tomorrow I'll be coming your way and uh, Sunday too I'll be coming your way as we try to bring everything to speed and try to uh, look at the various things that we need to focus on to increase our chances of passing the examination. So let me uh, bring up my screen quickly as we uh, jump into the discussion today. I see some of you guys joining, you are welcome. Give us a thumbs up on the video when you join and also put in the chat box for me any questions that you have uh, and something that you would want me to share my thought on as we look at these key issues, as we look at these key issues. So when it comes to the exams, uh, if you remember, we made mention of the fact that when it comes to corporate reporting, financial reporting, um, there are a couple of issues that we need to pay attention to. We're going to be focusing this afternoon discussion a little on uh, some standards uh, from the title, as you can see, IFRS uh, 5, sorry, IFRS 15, that is Revenue from contract with customers. Revenue from contract with customers. We're going to be getting into that in a moment. And then also see how far we can go in our discussion as we get excited about that. But when it comes to financial reporting and corporate reporting, we have emphasized and made mention of the fact that there are core issues that we need to uh, focus on and how we need to structure ourselves to increase our chances of passing the examination. We've mentioned that there is a five, six marks coming in from ethics. So you want to make sure you go over ethics very well. If there are any specific questions you have uh, that you would want me to share my thought on, don't hesitate. Put it in the chat for me. I'm going to be answering all your questions for you. I see some questions coming up and I'm going to be uh, taking all your questions as well as we continue. So ethics is going to be very critical there in the uh, exam hall. Then ratio analysis or evaluation of financial statements is going to be there. Now, for those of you doing corporate reporting, on top of the ratio analysis, there is also cash flow analysis. For those of you doing corporate reporting, there is cash flow analysis there. So in addition to the ratio analysis that you must know about, the examiner can also ask you questions relating to cash flow analysis. So if you are doing corporate reporting, you have to ensure you 
uh, know about this very well because the examiner could share some thought with you on that. Maybe your ratio questions or your evaluation question will be about ratio analysis and you have to be on the lookout to be able to answer that question. Then we're going to be having some theory uh, issues that examiner will uh, ask questions on that you have to be mindful on. So there is going to be some theory questions that examiner will be bringing. And if you remember, we mentioned that the examiner can bring theory questions on uh, consolidated financial statements. For those of you doing corporate reporting, that is a done deal. If you are doing financial reporting, it may or may not be there. But then theories on consolidated financial statements, something that we need to be on the lookout for. Issues about conceptual framework, uh, regulatory framework. The examiner can bring you uh, something on that. Uh, issues about the qualitative characteristics of financial statements, measurements basis and all that. It is very important because uh, the examiner can throw you some jobs there and you should be able to cover that when the examiner asks you. Then we can be asked even theory questions in the, on the standards, especially in corporate reporting. The examiner can bring some written questions on some of the standards that you have to be aware of uh, there. Then the other issues, maybe standard stages involving uh, certain standards, stages or processes involved in certain standards. These are all, you know, written questions that examiner can throw at you uh, in the exam hall that you need to be aware of when it comes to dealing with the uh, financial reporting or corporate reporting. So ethics is going to be there. Uh, there will be ratio questions. Like I said, if you are doing corporate reporting, cash flow analysis, you have to make sure you understand that because that is a question the examiner can throw at you. And if it does, you should be in the position to be able to uh, answer the question. Then the theories on consolidation, definitely. Then the accounting standards, IFRSs, IASs. You know, the examiner is going to be doing that to you. Now, for those of you doing financial reporting, if you remember, I have told you already that there is a 40 mark question. There will be IFRS dedicated questions and there will be single entity question that examiner will bring. Now, like I've said, don't ask me, Inshira, which single entity will the examiner bring? You are not supposed to know what the examiner will bring. All you are supposed to know about it, the accounting standards, because the two things here will be based on the accounting standards, and that is 40 marks for you there. But there are just some basic standards that you have to make sure you are aware of, and we keep on telling you about this. IAS 16, whether I like it or not, something about it is going to be there, financial reporting students. IAS 12, income tax, whether I like it or not, there is something about it that is going to uh, be there in the exam hall. These two standards are, you know, not negotiable when it comes to the final account uh, preparation. In addition to these guys, IFRS 9, you know, financial instruments, and it's uh, brother IAS 32, uh, also financial instrument uh, uh, recognition as well. Uh, it's going to be there in the exam hall. Not that it's going to be there, but it's a fundamental standard that you need to make sure you understand very well. Then the other standards, depending on how excited the examiner is and the questions that he would want you to answer in the exam hall. I see some of you guys joining. You are welcome. Uh, we are looking at financial reporting and corporate reporting today, but also I'm taking your questions. So if there are any specific questions that you have that you would want me to share my thought on, don't hesitate. Just put it in the chat and I'm going to be providing you with some answers. So give us a thumbs up on the video and also let me hear from you what challenges you have, something you would want me to share my thought on. Put it in the chat and let's get excited about it. Now, those of you doing corporate reporting, IFRS, that is going to be crucial for you as well in the exam hall. So there are some standards that when you are doing, if you are doing corporate reporting, you have to focus on. And we've said this over and over again, IFRS 9, financial instruments, IFRS 2, share-based payment, IAS 19, employee benefits. These three guys, two of them will be there in the exam hall, all other things being equal, uh, all, the, all the three will be there 
either as part of the notes in the consolidated financial statement. So as you are looking at the consolidated financial statement, part of the notes will be these standards, or we will have a dedicated question that the examiner will bring relating to these standards. So these standards, very crucial, very fundamental, if you are doing corporate reporting. Then IFRS 8, operating segment or segment reporting, it's also another standard here in the level three that you need to ensure you you know very well before you go to the exam hall. Because whether I like it or not, these guys are going to be there and you have to know about them. They are going to be there and you have to know about them. Then for consolidation purposes, there are a couple of standards or the consolidation standards. You must understand them very well. And this goes to everybody. IS 28, investment in associate, IFRS 10. Consolidated Financial Statement, IAS, uh, IFRS 3, Business Combination, Business Combination. At least these three guys, you must understand them very well because they are the fundamental standards for consolidated financial statements. And this is for both financial reporting students and corporate reporting students, because certainly the examiner is going to be throwing something at you. And if he does, you want to make sure that you are able to answer that and know about it very well in the exam hall. You want to know about that very well in the exam hall. So once you look at the standards, uh, then you go to the final part for uh, consolidated financial statements. Like we said, in the consolidated financial statements, the core workings are what you're supposed to do. Remember, we did a two-part series on the principles of consolidation. In case you missed that, you can check the uh, channel playlist and look at consolidated financial statements, and you should be able to uh, go through the principles. The principles are what you have to be mindful on, how to calculate goodwill, how to determine NCI, how to treat impairment. If goodwill is positive, how do you do that? If goodwill is negative, how do you treat that? You must make sure you understand that very well. Then, for those of you doing financial reporting and corporate reporting, uh, sorry, corporate reporting, there is going to be either business valuation or financial reconstruction, corporate reorganization. Either one or either the examiner will bring the question on business valuation or the question will be on financial reconstruction and business reorganization. So whatever be the case, you to make sure you learn the fundamental principles. Note that anytime the examiner post puts you on the spot to deal with financial reconstruction question, the capital reduction account will always be prepared. That is a very crucial thing that you need to understand. Anytime you are doing financial reconstruction accounts, whether you are asked or not, the capital reduction account will definitely be prepared. The capital reduction account will definitely be prepared. So that is something you need to make sure you pay attention to because the capital reduction account serves as a control account to complete the double entries that will be arising from the revaluation of assets to their fair value at the date of the reconstruction and also other standards or other treatments that would have to be dealt with. For instance, assets, some uh, assets must be written off. Some other things would have to also be uh, taken into consideration. So all these are issues that the examiner can uh, bring you up. And if you are brought up with it, you make sure that you uh, prepare the capital reduction account or business valuation. There are various methods there: the asset valuation method, the dividend valuation, the dividend uh, method, the cash flow method, uh, the um, how do we call it? The PE ratio, the dividend yield method. All these are methods of valuation that can be used. You want to make sure that you pay attention and go through them very well because you don't know what the examiner is going to be bringing. Uh, in the exam hall. So these are the few things that I just want to remind you on as you wrap up on your revision uh, tomorrow and Sunday. You want to make sure that ethics, you are strong in that ratios. You are very strong in the calculation and in the interpretation. Most importantly, you want to ensure that if you are doing corporate reporting, cash flow analysis, you look at it very well understand the principles very well about cash flow analysis because it's an area the examiner can throw at you. Then the theories on consolidation, you want to make sure you understand that very well. Then the standards, you don't want to over 
emphasize that because oh, I don't want to overemphasize that. You know that already. The standards will play a key role in this part of the discussion. So that is the issue there when it comes to dealing with a few areas that you have to focus on to increase your chances of ultimately passing the exams. And I see some charts coming in. Let's see if I can uh, take some questions real quick. Then we begin uh, to look at the standard that I want us to discuss this evening. If there are any questions, don't hesitate. Put it in the chat for me. If you are watching on Facebook or put it in the comment section for me. Uh, if you are also watching us on YouTube uh, and I'll be answering all your questions for you. Whatever question it is, is it uh, that it is you have, just drop it in and I'll be providing you with some answers. Eric Ochery said, good evening, sir. Good evening, Eric. Uh, Raymond Adongo said, uh, Inshira, God bless you. Please share your, please share on the major difference in treatment between convertible loan and the rest on IFRS 9. But we did a master class on IFRS 9, and uh, I would say that you can check out the full video on that uh, when it comes to dealing with financial instrument. But primarily, the issue here is that when it comes to financial instruments, it is either we are having a financial liability on one, sorry, financial asset on one side, then financial liability or equity instrument on the other side. Now, there is a financial asset if the entity in question is the one buying, if the entity is the one purchasing, okay? If the entity is the one, uh, yes, buying, purchasing, then that is a financial asset. Now, there is an equity or financial liability if the entity is the one issuing, okay, or selling, then there is a financial liability or, or equity. There's a financial liability or, or equity. But how do we determine if a financial instrument is a financial liability of, or equity? We answer the question, does the entity have an obligation to repay? So does the entity have an obligation to repay? So we answer that to say that if the entity has an obligation to pay, yes, that means it is a financial liability. If the entity has no obligation to pay, then it is going to be recognized as equity instrument. Then the recognitions, we said financial liabilities are recognized at fair value, less transaction cost. So if there is any transaction cost to incur, then they were going to be deducted from the fair value or the proceeds we had on the uh, issuance of the uh, loan notes or the financial liability so that we'll get the initial value. Then on subsequent measurement, financial liability will be carried at amortized cost. Okay, they are carried at amortized cost with an effective rate or effective interest recognizing the profit or loss account. With an effective interest recognizing the profit or loss account. With financial assets, what happens is that it can be carried at fair value through PL. Okay, then at fair value through OCI. Now, if it is carried at fair value through PL, then what happens is that any transaction cost will be recognized in PL accounts. Any transaction cost will be recognized in the PL account. Then any fair value gain or loss will also be recognized in the PL account. Right? But then if it is carried at fair value through OCI, then any transaction cost will be included in the initial cost of the asset. In the initial cost of the financial asset. Or the initial fair value of the financial asset. So that is a distinction there. If the financial asset is carried at fair value through PL, transaction costs incurred will be written off in the PL account, and any fair value movement will be recognized in the PL. If it is carried at fair value through OCI, transaction costs will not be recognized in the PL. Instead, it will be added to the uh, fair value of the financial asset, and on subsequent measurement, any fair value movement will be recognized in the OCI any fair value movement will be recognized in the OCI. Any fair value movement will be recognized in the OCI. All right? But then, if it is a debt instrument, then certainly, even though it's a financial asset, it will be carried at amortized cost with the effective interest rate recognized as investment income in the PL account. 
So if the financial asset is a debt, because when we purchased a debt instrument, it will still be carried at amortized cost on subsequent uh, measurement because if the debt instrument is not quoted on an active stock exchange market, then the fair value will not be able, we will not be able to determine the fair value. So in that case, the debt instrument will be carried at amortized cost. So that is basically the idea about financial instrument. But then an entity can issue convertible loan notes. An entity can issue a convertible loan note. So if an entity issue a convertible loan note, then it has to be uh, split between debt and equity. Okay, we have to split it between debt and equity. Why? Because in accordance with IAS 32, financial instrument presentation, we have to categorize the uh, financial uh, convertible loan note into the debt component and the equity component. All right, how do you get that? The debt component is simply the present value of the cash flows on the debt, and the equity component will be the balancing figure. So the equity component will be the proceeds minus, you know, the debt component which you calculated. If there is any transaction cost that is incurred, it is going to be allocated between uh, the two entities. So if you ask of accounting for the, uh, you know, financial instruments, that is basically what you must understand there. Like I mentioned, um, we did a master class on this. You can check it up on the channel uh, under accounting standard series. And it's what, part of the current videos that we did. And you can watch the full video on the IFRS 9 where we solve questions. And then you will see how these things add together. I see some of you guys coming up. You are welcome. Give us a thumbs up on the video when you join. But also let me know if there are any questions you have specifically. Put it in the chat for me. Put it in the comment section for me. I want to provide you with some answers as we get excited into the discussion today. Next one said, uh, please, I will also be happy if you could share your expert knowledge on variations and cancellation in share-based payments, IFRS uh, 2. I don't mean what you mean by I don't know what you mean mean by variation and now share based payment is a whole you know issue on it on a whole topic on it on maybe give me some specific context uh in that case because uh if I have to talk about variation and cancellation in in the general terms that means that I would have to talk about the whole standard of IFRS2 and uh we wouldn't be able to do that today Zamzilu said, uh, hi, Ishra, this is Zamzilu from Nigeria. I wish you successful deliberation as we go ahead with today's session. Okay, that's nice. Welcome to the stream. Um, Alice Koranga said, how are you, sir? Watching from Zimbabwe. Your tutorials helped me a lot. Have seated for my examination last week. Thank you so much. Keep doing a good job. Awesome. Wishing you all the best as you wait for your results what are the stages of standard setting um we are not going to be talking about that but uh it is available you can look out for rich um let me see if i can bring a slide about that uh in my presentation quickly if it is possible for me to do that can we do that yeah maybe so there are various stages involved now, the material I'm using, I think I've told you this already. This is from my book, a new book on financial reporting and corporate reporting. So we covered this. I mean, stages involving the standard setting process. There are broadly six stages that are involved in the standard setting process. So setting the agenda. So this is where the uh, International Accounting Standard Board comes to decide, hey, we need a new standard or there is an issue that is not being dealt with. Uh, so should we do something about it? Then they, got, they gather information about it, know what they have to do. Stage two, projects planning, they decide how they're going to go through with uh, the standard. Then the director of the technical activities will put all the documents together in relation to that. Then they develop uh, a discussion paper. 
and put it in the public space. What they are looking for is comments from the public, comments from professional, comments from consultants, comments from audit firms, comments from other regulatory bodies to provide their thoughts on the proposed standard that the International Accounting Standard Board is seeking to bring in or the amendment uh, to an existing standard that they seek to bring in. So that publication lasts for about, you know, 90 days for them to gather thoughts from people. But sometimes it may go beyond the 90 days, depending on the kind of standard that we are dealing with. Then after they receive all the comments, they're going to put all the comments together and then they will now publish again what we call an exposure draft. So this is like a summary of, okay, these are the, all the thoughts that we have put together so far, and these are the components that we intend to, you know, deal with in this particular standard. And that exposure draft will also be published so that the people who contributed to it initially, they will find out if really this was what they were expecting us to bring in. Then once that is done, they bring it back in, put the pieces together, then they issue the standard, and the standard is published uh, in that regard. Then you know, they carry out other procedures after the issuing of the standard. So basically, these are the six stages that are involved uh, in setting of the standards. For those of you with any book on financial reporting, some of these things uh, will be there for you to get uh, the detailed explanation or knowledge uh, from it. Any other questions? I see some of you guys coming up. Any other questions? Put it in the chat for me. Let's see what else we have here. Ocon said, thank you uh, so much. I really enjoy all your lectures. Always a pleasure. Nana Boabin Douglas said, can you help us with the memo writing on financial performance of entity? I don't know what you mean by memo though, but you will not be asked to write a memo it is either a report or an analysis directly that you do now if you are analyzing financial performance financial position that is evaluation of financial statement professional presentation is going to be very critical when it comes to the uh, preparation of the analysis so let's see what we do when it comes to this one now, this is a done deal waiting for us in the exam hall ratios. So calculating it is one story, but analyzing it is also another story. So how do we write out our analysis? Sometimes the examiner will ask you to prepare a report. Other time, he will just say write an analysis. So if he says write a report, then you must have your two. Whom are you writing to? The examiner will tell you. Maybe you are writing to management. You are writing to shareholders. Or you are writing to whatever. Whoever you are writing to, the name will be there. From who the heck are you? <laughs> you are the who. So who are you in the capacity? Now, if nothing is given, you can just say, oh, financial analyst. All right. Or you can say whatever. ICAG level two student or whatever the heck. So if you are not giving your uh, designation, then, you know, you just put financial analyst or ICAG level, final level student or something like that uh, there. So the to, the from is going to be there. We have to know about it. Then the subject, what are you writing on? Certainly, you know, performance evaluation of, you know, financial statement, you put it up. Then you can have your dates coming in. That will be the dates that you are writing the exam, 1st August. It could be 1st August or something like that. 1st August 2022. And that could be something that you have there for the period under review for that one. So that is it. If it is a report, this is your pro forma. But then uh, this, is, this is going to be a key thing. But if it is not a report and the examiner says just analyze the financial performance and financial position, then you need a heading. Then you just have to write a heading up. Evaluation of financial performance and financial position of the entity. 
evaluation of financial performance and financial position of an entity. That is very important there. That is very important today. So you have a heading. So if it is a report to, from, da, 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 da. If it is not a report, you have a heading. But when you are done like that, let's look at a real deal. After your, let's say it's a report. So if it is a report you are writing, you're going to have to, from, subject, and date. Then you go to introduction. You have to write introduction. Are you following me? You need to write introduction. It's very important. You need to write introduction. Now, your introduction should be brief. Tell us what the heck you are writing about. What is the purpose of your analysis? It should be in your introduction. Okay? Then, um, what uh, ratios are you using? Now, state the ratios in their categories. In their categories like profitability ratios, gearing ratios, uh, working capital ratios. State the categories, not that you're going to list all the ratios. We don't have time for that. Uh, so you're going to be uh, specific on the categories of the ratios. So what are you writing about? What is the ratios you are using? And what is the basis of comparison? Are you comparing it with the industry average or you are comparing it with previous year financial statement, or what are you comparing it with? So you state that up. So you write introduction, and then you write. So you can say that this report analyzes the financial performance and financial po position of Otium Limited for the year ended 31st October 2021 using profitability ratios, liquidity ratios, and gearing ratios. That's it. You see how clean that was? That is your introduction. That is your introduction. So you need to ensure that you are capturing that. You write introduction. Your next paragraph, financial performance. So this is where you're going to interpret the ratios relating to financial performance. And you know the ratios already. Asset turnover, gross profit margin, depending on what you are doing, um, gross profit margin, net profit margin, which can also be operating profit margin. Then the ROSI, return on capital employed. Now, when you are doing the interpretation, it is very important for you to bring these guys together. In other words, you start with the asset turnover, if it is available. When you are interpreting that, you talk about how capital employed is being used and then asset utilization then from there, you come to gross profit margin. When you're explaining gross profit margin, it will be prudent for you to make reference to the asset turnover ratio because it will tell you about the revenue generation and all those things. Then specifically, you talk about cost of sales. But don't just be generic and talk about cost of sales. Depending on the business in question, the components of cost of sales, you can talk about them. If it is a manufacturing company, then you can talk about purchases of raw material, uh, direct labor, cost, because all those things will be included in cost of sales. But if it is a service organization, you're going to be careful about the cost of sales of a service organization. If you're going to write material cost, where Diego? In other words, you are wrong. You get Zokpo for that, zero. So when you're interpreting the gross profit margin, you make reference to the asset turnover, then cost of sales. Then you go ahead and talk about net profit margin. If you are explaining net profit margin, you have to make reference to the asset turnover ratio and then the gross profit margin because the results from there will be able to help you to explain the operating profit margin. Then certainly you have to talk about operating expenses. Again, you don't talk about operating expenses in general. You must talk about the components of operating expenses, like distribution costs. So, for instance, if the asset turnover is going up, which means revenue is going up during the year, also in absolute terms, and then your net profit margin is falling, why is that? Yeah, it could mean because 
the entity is selling more, hence it is incurring a lot in this uh, distribution cost. So probably it has bought assets during the year, more depreciation on the distribution van, and they are paying more fuel uh, and other sales uh, costs because they have to satisfy the increase in the sales. So when you are talking about operating expense being a reason why the net profit margin ratio is reducing or increasing is higher or lower, it is important to talk about a component of the operating expense rather than just write generically operating expense. Then you come to Rosie, return on capital employed. And when you are explaining return on capital employed, you have to make sure that you make uh, reference to all the above that we have mentioned if they are available. Reference to asset turnover. How are we generating revenue? Gross profit margin. How is cost of sales? Net profit margin. How is operating expenses? there then suddenly you make reference to capital allow capital employed because you know capital employed is going to affect the rosy and the assets turnover as well so when we are interpreting the ratios that's the order in which you are expected to do that and we have looked at ratio analysis you can watch the video on the uh, on the youtube channel you check the playlist on uh think accounting standards or financial statement and you will get we did a two part or three part video or so explaining how all these things work out and you can explain them there so to, to, to what i'm trying to say is that to excel in the analysis you have to do the analysis together but you have to be careful about your language because the basis of comparison would determine the language you use Stay with me carefully. The basis of comparison would determine the language you use. And that is very important. So for instance, if you are comparing the entity with industry average, stay with me carefully. You are comparing the entity with industry average or another entity. You have to be careful about the choice of words you use. Now, if you are comparing the entity and industry average, you cannot say eh, the ratio is increasing or the ratio is reducing. No, because you are comparing two things. You are comparing two separate entities. So nothing is increasing, nothing is reducing. You cannot say that. So for instance, you are doing rosy, then the entity's rosy is 40%, then the industry average is 30%. Then you say, oh, the uh, entity's rosy is rising in the year under review. Hey, sister, what is rising here? You are comparing industry average to rosy, so uh, to the entity. So you cannot use the word increasing or reducing when you are comparing the entity and industry average or another entity. You cannot, you cannot use increasing, reducing. You cannot. What then do you say? Yes, it is higher than, it is greater than, fine. But you cannot say it's increasing, it is rising, it is falling. Some of you, the English that you write, cried, yeah, yay, only God will deliver us. Oh, it's rising like sunshine, it's falling like mango. <laughs> You cannot say all that when when you are comparing two companies, uh, two separate entities, that because nothing is rising, nothing is falling, it's not mango, nothing is increasing, nothing is reducing, it's not inflation. So you have to be careful about your choice of words when doing the interpretation. Now, certainly, if we are looking at the same entity year on year then anything you say you are right if it is the same entity year on year meaning you are comparing current year with previous year no p you can say rising because definitely you can say falling definitely oh higher than last year lower than last year yeah you can you can say everything you want to say there and you're going to be correct the active verbs rising falling increasing decreasing you can say them when it is the same entity year on year however if your basis of comparison is the entity with another entity or industry average please please you are forbidden from using the words rising reducing 
sorry, rising, falling, increasing, reducing. Because when you are comparing two separate entities, nothing is rising, nothing is reducing, nothing is falling nothing is increasing so you have to be mindful of your choice of active verbs as you explain the ratios your choice of active verbs when you explain the ratios all right so introduction keep it simple keep it sweet then you write financial performance you explain those ratios there then if there is liquidity in the uh, in the thing you bring in liquidity and efficiency ratios so that'll be your next paragraph. Then you write on the various liquidity ratios. Maybe you have current ratio there. Write on this. If it is quick ratio there, write on it. Uh, trade receivable days, trade payable days, whatever it is, explain and go. Then your third paragraph or your fourth. Remember paragraph one is intro. Paragraph two is performance measurement. Paragraph three is efficiency and liquidity ratios, depending on what the examiner will ask. Then the next paragraph will be jeering. If we are doing jeering ratios, jeering. Jeering here, you know you are going to look at the debt to equity ratio and then the interest cover ratio. Like I said, you have to be specific and write introduction, financial performance, liquidity and efficiency, jeering or financial position all right that is very very important so these are the key paragraphs in your analysis and this is a 15 mark area you have to be mindful on and professional presentation is very critical your active words very uh, active verbs very critical your tenses very critical and i laugh at my students all the time when they write a ratio and send to me and you know it's always interesting when I'm reading their text and we are discussing it together. So that is it. Now, when you finish like that, you bring in your conclusion paragraph. So you bring in conclusion. The conclusion, you want to keep it simple. Tell us about the overall performance of the organization. So on the overall, what would you say about the organization? Then make some recommendations. What can they do? So as you are analyzing, you saw some issues that a company had. So make some recommendations. Then based on the question, if there are other issues you're supposed to talk about, you're supposed to talk about, you bring that as well in that case. You bring that as well about it. So that is the issue about that. That is what you need to understand there. So that is how you present your analysis when it comes to dealing with this. That is what we deal with it. Any questions, please? Any questions? So that's it. So that's the pro forma if you ask me on that. then let's see if we have other comments coming in so that that question was coming in from nana boabin and it is a very key issue that is why i took my time to talk about it because it's actually it actually cuts across board for you guys nurudin said uh good evening sir please i need your guide on how to combine related topics in fr to study i think i have mentioned uh this issue to you uh, there is not going to be much combination apart from the standards. It is the standards that you can combine, the standards and single entity that you combine because the standards are jointly together. If you are doing IAS 16, it doesn't work alone. There are standards that are connected with IAS 16. I always tell you this. There is IAS 23 there, borrowing cost. There is IAS 20 there, government grants. There is IAS 37 there, provisions contingent liability there is IAS 12 there income tax when it comes to subsequent measurement of assets there is IAS 16 there uh, there is IAS 36 rather impairment of assets that we need to know about there is IAS 40 investment property it has a connection there we must know about it when we are dealing with it 
then there is IFRS 16 relationship even that we need to understand. So you realize that IS 16 is like the anchor. Okay? It's like the anchor that holds a lot of standards. It's like the anchor that holds a lot of standards. So if you want to say, oh, how do I combine topics to study? The secret is more on the standards. That's where you can do a lot of relationships there. For instance, these three standards have relationship. IFRS 9, IFRS 16, IFRS 15, revenue from contract with customers. They go hand in hand. Why? Because whilst you are talking about leases, IFRS 16, if you are talking about sale and lease back, then IFRS 9 and IFRS 15 would have to be used in that case. So these three standards also have relationship that we must know about. So if you ask about combination, really it is the standards that you can really learn and combine with. Why? Because ethics is independent. It doesn't have relationship with any other thing in the book. Um, the ratios is not totally independent because uh, sometimes you may do adjustments in the ratios and you need the accounting standards. So you have to be formidable in the accounting standards because there are some ratio type questions which may require adjustments. And so ratios is the consolidation, which is the final thing. It's also there on its own. It also there on its own. But before you come to consolidation, you have to make sure you understand the accounting standards. Because if you remember, I told you that in the fair value adjustment for the consolidation, we did a two-part masterclass this week on consolidation. Make sure you watch that if you have not watched it. The, in the fair value measurement, IAS 16 is going to be there. Uh, IAS 38 may be there. IAS 12 may be there. IAS 37 may be there. Fair value adjustments. Fair value adjustment. Fair value adjustment. So when you are doing consolidation also, before you get there, like it will be prudent for you to know these standards so that when you get there and these fair value measurements are there, you know how to treat them. So if you ask me, the accounting standard is the bedrock or they are the bedrock. Once you know the accounting standards, ethics is on its own, ratio is on its own, but you are going to use the ratio, the standards knowledge. Then consolidation is on, is on its own, but you have to use the previous standards that you have learned, as I've listed here. Then the theories, conceptual framework, regulatory framework, those are reading aspects. You have to read them. Okay, those are reading aspects, uh, and you have to read them in that case. So if you ask me how you learn the topics together in financial reporting, I would say, the real deal is the accounting standards. Know how to learn. So don't tell me that, oh, Inshira, finish IAS 12. Please. You are lying. You have not finished. Don't tell me you finished IAS 37. You are lying because you are not done. Because until you have the connection between them, and the only way you can do that is if you practice a lot of questions and expose yourself to a lot of questions. If you do that, then suddenly certainly you will be able to, you know, write a lot and uh, get a lot of things in that case. So uh, that is from Nurudin. How do I combine the related topics? That's how you do it. That's how you do it. Walter Simba said, watching from Zimbabwe. Thanks for joining us, Walter. I meant when an entity cancels a transaction in share-based payment before the vesting period, how do you treat it? If the entity cancels it, you reverse whatever cumulative amount that is available uh, there. Because if you know about the way it is treated, then on the dates that they cancel it, we just reverse it. If it is a share appreciation right, then it was recognized as liability. So we de-recognize liability and then bring it in the PL. That is all. Then if it is a share option they gave, then it was being recognized in equity, other components of equity. So you de-recognize it and then uh, come and write it in the PL account. So if there is a cancellation before the vesting period and nobody has exercised, whatever amount that has been recognized on the face of the statement of financial position is just canceled out. It's just de-recognized on the face of the statement of financial position. Wow, I'm satisfied. Thanks, Inshira. Okay. Um, what else do I have? Inshira, please, when are we writing strategic 
when are we writing strategic i'll get a uh, share good evening sir uh strategic case studies on friday i guess i don't know what you mean by when are you saying we should write um issue relating to strategic case study uh like i said uh we've not had a lot of requests on on case study uh to share my thought uh with you on on that but it has been discussed in our main class and uh the various things that must be you know taken into consideration this is our, our document on the strategic case study uh analysis and uh we've discussed this uh in class with our with our students but like i said we've not received uh requests a lot of requests uh from case study so that is why we have not you know made anything on that but it has been discussed in the main class on the key modules the key aspects of the case that we have to look out for um doing your SWOT analysis your pestle your SWOT analysis presentation as you can see i mean all these things are covered in our analysis documents which is available uh to our students but we've not received much request here so i cannot you know do it if we've not received a lot of engagements uh, relating to it because sometimes that is also something that we look at before we uh do the broadcast about something nanabu have been said thanks very much always a pleasure let's see what else we got has no no hamza said good evening sir what's the appropriate phrases to be used when comparing industry average and sector average thank you and god bless you all the appropriate phrases uh, like i said the only thing that you cannot say is oh it's increasing it's reducing do you understand it that's the only thing you cannot say it's increasing it's reducing it's falling it's rising you cannot say that but then whatever be the case so if rosy of the company is higher than the industry average then you state the rosy of the entity is higher than the industry average this is due to you go ahead but you can't say the rosy of the company is rising because you are comparing two separate entities so apart from rising falling increasing decreasing any other you know phrase sentence words you're good. You're good. As far as you're not telling us falling like mango or rising like the sunshine or <laughs> increasing like inflation or reducing like COVID, you're good in that case. You're good in that case. So that is what I would say there uh, on that. That's what I would say there. Nuruddin said, thanks for the clarification. Always a pleasure. Any other questions, please? Any other questions? Any other questions? you put it in the chat for me or you put it in the comment section for me if there are any other questions okay so let me bring back my screen so generally like i mentioned um these are a number of issues uh that we need to understand then let me do a quick intro uh for us on ifrs 15 revenue from contract with customers ifrs 15 revenue from contract with customers uh, this is a, a standard that is uh really fundamental and uh it's it's fundamental because revenue recognition is a core aspect of dealing with financial statement preparation so it is important we know how revenue should be recognized now this standard is replacing a number of standards but keenly it's replacing the old ias 18 revenue okay and then also ias 11 construction contract construction contract but then the the sweet is the sweetness here is that the, the the main thing about ifrs 15 is that um the key issues that you need to understand about ifrs 15 is that revenue is recognized when um 
a performance obligation is, rec uh, is satisfied. Revenue is recognized when a performance obligation is satisfied. When a performance obligation is satisfied. What does that mean? It means we only recognize revenue when we have done the job. Simple. Simple. You only recognize revenue when a performance obligation is satisfied. So for instance, if you come to me and say, Inshi, um, I want you to teach me. And I said, all right, I'm going to teach you. Then he said, okay, Inshira, teach me for three months so I can write my exams. Then I said, all right, three months, that's okay. Um, then I said, okay, I'm going to charge you $800 for the three months. Then he said, okay, that's fine. Yeah, you have to say that's fine. Why? You want to pay me $50 for that? So $800 for that. That's cool. I cannot recognize revenue when we close the deal. That was what IAS 18 was doing. Because under IAS 18, we were using the accrual method where revenue is recognized when the transaction takes place. So under IAS 18, what companies were doing is that immediately revenue, uh, the transaction takes place, they recognize revenue. Whether the activity will be undertaken in the year or will be undertaken in subsequent years. So that limitation is what IFRS 15 is trying to solve. So in, under IFRS 15, we recognize revenue only when a performance obligation is satisfied. Okay. So what if we receive some money in advance of the beginning of the contract? Or when we sign the contract, we receive some money. Simple. Revenue receive or income received in advance or let's put it this way any payment received in advance any payment received in advance is recognized as deferred income is recognized as deferred income why? Because you've not started doing the job. So if I go back to my illustration, yeah, I'm going to teach you for three months. Before I teach you, you have to pay me my money. I don't have time chasing people for money. So before I start teaching you, you pay the money first. So when you pay the $800 to me, we cannot recognize revenue. Why? Because we've not done the job. So how would that $800 be recognized? It will be recognized as a deferred income. What would be the journal entry? I debit my bank. If you wired a, a cash, a check for me, or a debit cash with the eight hundred dollars, then I credit deferred income. That's a liability on the face of the statement of financial position. I credit deferred income. I credit deferred income. So any payment received in advance is recognized as deferred income. But you have to note, as it is recognized as deferred income, it must be split between uh, or divided between current and non-current liability. So it must be classified between current and non-current liability. Between current and non-current liability. The current will be anyone, any amount that will be receivable based on the performance obligation in the next 12 months. Then anything beyond that will be recognized as non-current liability. So number one, we recognize revenue when a performance obligation is satisfied. Number two, any payment received in advance is recognized as deferred income. That is the key thing here. That is a key thing here. That is a key thing here. So if this is the principle, then that is what we do it. Number three is that where performance obligation is more than a year, where performance obligation is beyond one year, 
where performance obligation is, is beyond one year, revenue shall be recognized based on the percentage of completion. Revenue shall be recognized based on percentage of completion or based on stage of completion. Based on stage of completion. So in accordance with IFRS 9, we can recognize revenue when performance obligation goes beyond a year. This is where you're dealing with construction contract. So if performance obligation goes beyond a year, then we recognize revenue based on the stage of completion. Now, when it comes to the stage of completion, when it comes to the stage of completion, it can be dealt with in two ways. We have the input method and the output method, depending on the context of the question and the method that you're going to be using. Input method and output method. Input method and output method. So when it comes to the input method, this is where we see the stage of completion will be equal to cost incurred to date divided by total contract cost. Cost incurred today divided by the total contract cost times 100. But when it comes to the output method, it is where we look at the work certified or contract invoice divided by the total contract cost, divided by total contract cost times 100, divided by the total contract cost times 100 divided by the total contract cost times 100. So that is how we calculate the stage of completion. Because that stage of completion will be used to calculate or to know the revenue that should be allocated. But there are two more things that you need to understand here. So let's expand on this a little bit. So one, we calculate profit or loss. We calculate profit or loss on the contract. And how do we get profit or loss? Simple, contract revenue or contract price. Then we less cost incurred to date. With less cost incurred to date, I'm going to put two cash columns. Then, further cost to completion or additional cost to completion. So, cost incurred to date, additional cost to completion. These two will give us the total contract cost. These two will give us the total contract cost. We subtract that. And that will give us profit or loss on the contract. Profit when it is positive, loss if it is negative. So you have to calculate from the contract, are we going to make profit? Are we going to make a loss? You calculate that. You calculate that. Now, once you calculate that, then you have to look at how you do your treatment. You have to look at how you do your treatments. Now, how do you do the treatment? Very simple. You bring in your, if it is a loss, where the contract has a loss, the loss or the contract loss, the contract loss is recognized in the profit or loss. The contract is recognized in the profit or loss as per IAS 38. Sorry, IAS 37, provisions, contingent liability, contingent assets. 
Now, if you remember under provisions, contingent liability, contingent asset, one of the uh, situation or circumstances that may create provisions is onerous contracts. So when a contract results into a loss, we have to provide for it. So the journal entry is that you're going to debit profit or loss. Simply, then you're going to credit provisions on the face of the statement of financial position relating to the contract. Relating to the contract. This is what we do if it is a loss. But if it is a profit, then we recognize revenue and profit based on the percentage of completion. So where the contract has a profit, revenue and profit is recognized. Revenue and profit is recognized based on stage of completion. Based on stage of completion. Based on stage of completion. So, like we are just looking at the principles. Number one, recognize revenue when a performance obligation is satisfied. Number two, any payment received in advance, it's recognized as a deferred income and must be categorized or classified into current and non-current liabilities. Number three, where performance obligation is beyond a year, then revenue is recognized based on the stage of completion. The stage of completion, we can use the input method or the output method and we have to calculate a profit or loss on the project and calculation of the profit or loss on the project we would have to look at a co contract cost of the project then we would have to also uh, find out if it is a loss we provide for it directly as per IAS 38 37 sorry but if it is a profit then that profit we have to recognize revenue and the profit using the stage of completion using the stage of completion any questions please any questions any questions see some of you guys joining any questions uh for me let's see do i have any questions coming in for me let's see okay so i'm seeing a question coming up A quick walkthrough retirement benefits plan. <laughs> That's IAS 19, I guess. Um, okay, maybe we can do that tomorrow uh, when we come, because tomorrow we're going to be having a, a discussion as well. So we can do that tomorrow when we come, IAS 19. We could walk through that. Hi, right, Shira, how is the account, how the accounting treatment will be if? period between the completion of performance obligation and payment of transaction price is more than a year. I don't understand how the accounting treatment, the accounting treatment will be if the period between the completion of performance obligation and payment of transaction price is more than a year. The issue is we recognize revenue when performance obligation is satisfied. So if we have satisfied a performance obligation, but a customer has not paid that yet, that's not an issue. It means you recognize uh, receivables in your books because the journal entry will be for you to debit uh, receivables because you've done the job already. So you debit receivables and then you credit revenue because you have done the work, so you have to recognize revenue. So if at the time of satisfying the performance obligation uh, or after satisfying performance obligation, the customer does not pay us or pays us later on, we recognize receivables. Then later on, if the customer comes to pay, we now debit cash. 
and derecognize the receivables by crediting the receivables. That'll be it. That'll be it. So that is the issue about that Zamzilu Ado. Let me know if that is what you were asking about in your discussion. So that is the issue uh, about that. And um, for timing purposes, I'm going to uh, wrap up uh, today here uh, because, you know, we have our financial reporting class coming up uh, shortly. So I'm going to be wrapping up here uh, today so that God willing, tomorrow I'll be coming your way. I think around 7 p.m. tomorrow. So tomorrow, 7 p.m., uh, whatever questions you have still on corporate reporting, financial reporting, uh, to see what we can do there. Then generally, any other questions you have in uh, other subjects, you can bring that up also on the stream as we see and look at what we can do to assist you so you can prepare well for the examination and most importantly, pass the exams. So tomorrow... Uh, at 7 p.m., I'll be coming your way. Make sure that you uh, get a notification. What you can do is you subscribe to the channel, click the bell notification icon, so that in case you even miss uh, uh, it, once we go live, you will get the notification sent to you uh, by YouTube so that you can join the stream and be part of the discussion there. So I'm going to wrap up here today. And tomorrow, 7 p.m., we will come your way and we will see if we can, you know, have some time. And then whatever question it is that you want me to share my thought on, you put it in the chat. Then we can talk about it, discuss it, and then definitely, you know, go through it generally for us to see what we can do. So that's it about that. Thanks for joining me on the stream and uh, really appreciate the thumbs up. And the sharing that you guys, I mean, those of you who are sharing the video, really, really helpful uh, because it helps us to grow more. Constance, Francis, Upon Prince, Humphrey, Justica, Kelvin, um, who else we got there? Amina, and uh, who else we have? Yes, all of you guys. Thank you very much. And those of you with a thumbs up on, YouTube also really, really appreciate that. I'll catch you tomorrow at 7 p.m. God willing, as we continue with our discussion towards the August 2022 examination. Like I said, just focus on the key issues. Be strong on your ethics. Be strong on your, you know, ratios. Be strong on your standards. We cannot overemphasize the standards. Be strong on them. Then suddenly you wrap up on consolidation and you should be good uh in that so that's it about that thanks very much and i'll catch you same time tomorrow not same time tomorrow i mean 7 p.m tomorrow because i mean yeah tomorrow is saturday so we'll do 7 p.m okay stay safe and uh stay blessed